everybody my name is Quinn Jacobson and this is the studio Q show live and no matter what time you're watching it it doesn't matter you're gonna get the same information as the folks in here but it's really good to see people in here and actively uh, participating if you will uh, hey Wilson's Dell Wilson's lurking and Steve good to see you two Wilson's in the same shot Steve and Dale and Mr. Johansson and Craig Din Craig Dinsdale, good to see you too. And of course, Jeffrey and Pablo and Bogoslaw, good to see you, gentlemen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We've got a great, uh, we've got a great kind of interesting, if you will, show to present. I know most of you will never attempt these processes, but here's the thing: I am on a quest for the perfect negative. The perfect negative, looking for the process that produces the best quality, um, and that's that's the wet collodion. That's the different types of binders, different types of processes, and we're going to look at another one of those today. So let's let's jump right on it and do this because at the end of the day, that's what we're here for. Let me push my comments over there. Let me get my little uh, guide up because you know me. If I don't do this. We will be rambling for days here, so I need I need to stay on track, and this helps me do this. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here it is, October 9th, 2021. I just, wow, where is the time going? I feel like I'm uh, missing out already. 2021 is gone. So today, we are going to look at a very interesting process called the Collodio Albumin Process, or the collodion albumin. However you want to say it, it's perfectly fine. We know what you mean. We are going to add, last two weeks we looked at the albumin on glass process. We're going to add a layer of collodion in there and, and, and tell you what that means. This is really good stuff. So we're going to cover that. But first we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of things going on. I don't know if we have any uh, Edgar Allan Poe fans out there, but um, he, uh, this was in Petapixel or something, I think. I can't remember. Yeah, it is, petapixel.com. The link's right there. This is, uh, he wrote an article about the daguerreotype. Uh, very interesting. You need to jump over there and read that when you can. Um, you know, he, he, you know what he's known for, of course, but he was really impressed and very, pro very prophetic about what photography was going to do in the world. And he writes about it in this article in the Philadelphia paper called Alexander's Weekly Messenger. He wrote it in January 1840, titled The Daguerreotype, of course. Uh, in the piece, Poe called the invention perhaps the most extraordinary triumph of modern science. Uh, that is not an understatement by any means. So if you haven't seen that, jump over there. There's the link there. You can just go to Petapixel and and um, it was, uh, it's older, I guess, 2015, but um, his death date or his birth date was just recently. So uh, that's, I guess, probably why they published it again, but very good stuff. And then Jeffrey, thank you very much. Send uh, this week, send in, uh, this is again for Petapixel, um, how UV photography can revolutionize the fight against skin cancer. And I know a lot of you have seen this. In fact, we've talked about this before um, in past shows a long, long time ago, of course. But this is interesting for us because it does a couple of things. It talks about how, how UV works, how UV light works. That is our primary source in wet collodion and these historic processes. That is the primary light source. So it's very interesting. And I love how they publish this uh, spectrum, this uh, light spectrum down here. And all the way to the left there, you see the gamma rays down in the 100 nanometer range. And all the way to the right, 
let me see up there in the post 800 nanometer range, uh, radio waves actually starting really lower than that. And our visible spectrum is so tiny. And we often talk about UVA and UVB, uh, UVA being the primary source for wet collodion. And you can see that's in the 350, 375 to 400 nanometer range. That's the bright white. And then we go all the way up to about 550 nanometers and we kind of completely lose it. And people often ask me, why, why don't you, you know, all the old literature talks about this calico yellow. Why don't you have your dark room and your filtering yellow? Um, it, because you can see right there on the spectrum, yellow is not as, quote, blackout as the red. I like to get up in the 700 nanometer spectrum. Um, in the red zone for my stuff. So my filter, the ruby lift on the windows, the red lights, if you wear a light or the red overhead light, um, way up there in the 700 nanometer. And you can still see just fine. Uh, mostly back in the day, it was because they didn't really have access to that stuff. So, but you can see there, we're talking about uh, UV light and UV photography and collodion would be considered... <laughs> UV photography for all intents and purposes here um, goes under the skin, shows the melanin. That's why we see the freckles. That's why you've seen my portraits with people with the, the UV protected contact lenses in and they've got the alien eyes. And um, I'm going to show you one here that, that, that really threw the newspaper off. Hey, good morning uh, from Queensland, Australia. Good to see you, Mr. Burgess, Mur Murray Burgess. Um, but you can see, I think it's, uh, by the way, I think it's probably about two o'clock in the morning, Murray, there. I would I would assume that you're way late up there, so, or down there, down under. But anyway, welcome. So you, you'll be able to see here what I'm talking about. So they go on to talk about, used by derm, uh, uh, dermatology laboratories since the era of film photography. This technique was used by the R&D centers to show protective properties and cosmetic products against UV radiation from the sun. That's why if you ever have a sitter, and especially if you're using natural light and, a, and an old vintage period lens, and somebody has the uh, base makeup on, uh, usually females, uh, they have base makeup or they have uh, sun protection, SFP protection lotion on, they will go very dark, just like glasses, just like contact lenses, all of that stuff. That's what they primarily used it for. And the development of digital photography has made it easier to use UV photography and UV videography. And you go on to, you can read that and, and, and it, it's a great, it's a great article and it's a great way of explaining how this uh, specific, uh, specific spectrum of light works. And we definitely, that is our primary source in wet collodion. And a lot of you have seen this. This is a newspaper many, many moons ago. I think it was 2003 or 2004. The newspaper there called me up and asked if they could do an article on me. And I said, yeah, come on over. And I, I had a tattoo artist buddy named Dan Solis. I said, Dan, can you come up here? It was just spur of the moment. Can you come up to the studio? And I want to photograph you for the newspaper. He said, yeah, sure. So he came up and I knew what this was going to do, right? All of his tattoos disappeared. As green and blue tattoos disappeared. And if we look at the spectrum, we know why that's the case. Now, can you photograph people with tattoos in wet cloning? Absolutely. Especially if you use a modern lens, if you use uh, strobes or some artificial light source, and the more scrimming, the more you scrape across the tattoo, and the darker, the dark blacks and reds in tattoo obviously show up. These greens and blues obviously completely disappeared. And the, the, the newspaper freaked out. It was it was a good time because, you know, you're whole, I think it was an eight by 10 plate and you're holding that plate, you know, and he's like, he really, he got, he teared up when he saw this plate. He said, I look like my grandfather, like a warrior, you know, um, and it, it was, it was a beautiful plate. I think I gave it to him. I hope I did. I didn't, I, I mean, it was just for the demonstration, but this is a classic example of how this process sees what light source it uses. That's why, when people talk about artificial light versus natural light, there's absolutely no comparison. Can you make good photographs with natural, uh, artificial light? Absolutely you can, but it's never going to exploit the uh, that look and feel that we, we know. And I think most of us has come to really love and appreciate, but there's a good, good example of it anyway. There's a whole bunch more, but 
Thanks for sharing that, Jeffrey. That was a great jump uh, into light and sources and, and UV and the spectrum that we use. So what is the collodio albumin process? This is for making negatives, but there's a caveat here, and we're going to talk about that as we jump into uh, Monkhoven's Monk book here. Um, so this process is almost identical to the albumin on glass, but with a layer of sensitized collodion applied and washed before applying the iodized albumin. Now, this gets super complicated. Now we're talking about a double binder. We're talking about a layer of collodion, sensitized collodion, or, or salted collodion, and we're talking about a layer of salted um, albumin. Those are the, that's the double binder on this piece of glass. Um, there is some speculation about clarity and sensitive, uh, sensitivity. So we're talking, why would you use this? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what, what the inventor says here. The Clodio albumin process is one of the early dry plate processes invented by Joseph Sidebotham in 1861. The process lacked economic success because the plate was much less sensitive and tended to have harder contrast than the wet plate process. Uh, while the first was acknowledged by Sidebotham, the latter was disputed by him, indicating that the fact that the 1862 gold medal for the best landscape photography was made with a collodio albumin negative in print. And that's in Recreative Science 1861. So why would you use this? If you're after that ultimate clarity, that ultimate detail, that 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 maximum kind of whatever we want to call it, that je ne sais quoi, whatever it is, right? Um, you may be interested in at least experimenting with this. By the time I'm finished, you may say, God, no, that was interesting, but I'm not going to try this. But we'll, we'll see what you say. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to get your feedback. So that's what it is. Think of it as a double binder. A negative a collodion and albumin is the binder and everything else is pretty much the same. We'll go through it here and you can check it out. So again, this is from a great book. If you haven't downloaded this book, please get it. It's a popular treatise on photography. Uh, this is D. Van Monkhoven. Um, and, and this is translated by uh, Thornwaite um, in, in England, London in 1863. So great book. Um, I, I love all these, you know, this, I love all this old literature and I, I highly recommend people getting this stuff. It's free and it's available. So let's go through the process here. Again, this is the collodio or collodion albumin process, double binder process. So right off the bat, when I first read this, I was like, God, what is he going through here? And what this is, this is a long description of making 50 plates, get prepping 25, 50 plates of this stuff. So I'm going to break it down and just say, let's just do two or three plates or one or two plates, whatever you want to do, right? Enough to, to get you through. But this, he goes into extensive detail here about how you have this big trough set up that you can stack 10 or 12 plates around. And again, keep in mind, these guys weren't like us today. Most of us are not commercial photographers in this historic process sense. Most of us anyway. Um, so these guys were after maximum, how they spent their time, um, uh, you know, like buying a bunch of film, right? So prep a bunch of it. Don't waste your time. It's not economical. Do 25 or 50 plates. And you'll, you'll see what I mean here as we read this. So, <clears throat> As by this process considered, a number of plates can be prepared in a few hours, which is very convenient, especially for obtaining stereoscopic positive proofs upon glass, which will be uh, presently described. This is another reason he's talking about mass producing these things as positives to sell them. The following will be found in an excellent method uh, and one which will enable 100, 100 of these plates to be properly prepared in two operations of four hours of continuous work. So he's saying you can do 100 plates in four hours by using this um, uh, continuous work. It being understood that the glasses do not exceed the dimensions of nine by seven and that they're all cleaned beforehand. So again, we know we're working with glass and any of these processes, we know cleaning is paramount. In the dark room uh, are arranged two vessels, good aperture, one beside the other. In uh, other words, he has two dishes of porcelain basically containing a silver bath composed of, and you see there it's about a 6.8% bath. 
68 grams to about 1,000, 1,035 milliliters of DH2O or distilled water. One bath may be employed, but the other, uh, the other operation as will be perceived as much quicker. Ordinary negative collodion may be used, but it will be found an improvement if the collodion is a little less iodized, such as obtained by adding to the ordinary collodion, of which the formula has been given on page 22. So if you look at this, basically, this is, I gave you a 250 mil working recipe here. 120 mils of plain USP collodion, 65 ether, 65 mils of alcohol, two and a half grams of cadmium bromide, or cadmium iodide, and one gram of cadmium bromide. And you can use three mils of DH2O to dissolve the salts if you want. Um, they're both very soluble. They're both, you know, um, soluble in, in, in solvent. So for the purpose of facilitating the description, the glass plates will be designed in letters A, B, and C. So this is where it goes through the operation of uh, pouring the collodion, sensitizing it in the silver bath, and then washing the free silver from the plate. That's all we're really doing here. So if you go up to the top here, you'll read step one, flow the plate. And this is just me synthesizing this down. Step one, flow the plate with bromoiodized collodion. Step two, sensitize the plate in the silver bath for three minutes. Step three, wash the plate in distilled water until the rivulets or the, the lines are gone, right? And that getting rid of that free silver. And step four, place the plate in another DH2O or distilled water bath for three minutes. That's as simple as it is. You've now prepared the first steps. You've collodion, salted collodion, sensitized it silver, washed that free silver off of that. Now it's in a pan of distilled water waiting for this next step. So on to uh, the next step. Um, he goes on to say here that uh, he talks about throwing some table salt in and precipitating the, the silver chloride off and then able to turn that in and re retrieve silver from it, et cetera, et cetera. But here, here it is. So you're going to now prepare the iodized albumin. So fresh foul eggs are broken across the middle and the whites carefully separated and then poured into a glass glazed earthen vessel to which added a quantity of iodide, potassium iodide, equal to seven and a half grains to the white of each egg employed. Before adding the potassium iodide to the white of the egg, it should be dissolved in an equal weight of water. For example, if 10, 20, or 50 eggs are used, 75, 150, 375 grains of iodide, potassium iodide are required dissolved in 75, 150 or 375 grains of water. So I broke it down there on the right for you. Let's take one egg, 0.5 or a half a gram of potassium iodide, Ki, uh, dissolved in before you add it, add it to the white, 0.5 or half a mil of distilled water. So we just did an example here. 10 eggs, 10 egg whites, 5 grams of potassium iodide and 5 mils of DH2O to dissolve that 5 mils of, of potassium iodide then add it to the whites. Beat it up as normal, right? And he talks about the hole is then beaten completely into a froth by the means of twi bundled of twigs represented in figure 72 or by the thin iron mounted handle. We use egg beaters, right? We like to froth that stuff up, go for it, get it done. And then for 12 hours, the greater proportion is resolved into a clean, clear albumin which can be poured off into white, just like making albumin for your prints. This is no different. This iodized albumin is used to pour over the collodionized glasses after they have been taken from the trough. So let's go back now. We've got that, that uh, sensitized collodion, salted collodion plate, the sensitized in silver wash sitting in the distilled water. So you're going to remove the collodionized plate from the distilled bath and first flow over uh, a working, so take some of that iodized albumin and sacrifice a little bit, pour it over, pour it off into another bottle. This is what you're going to, he talks about it here. He wants a prep um, before you actually put the real iodized albumin on here again. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, so he says, uh, pour over the collodion uh, glasses after they have been taken from the trough or the water and drained for one or two minutes on a wooden shelf. Mr. Uh, Tapenot employed fermented albumin, but it's not generally used or recommended. I don't know why he put that in there. I guess may have been popular at the time. 
Uh, iodized albumin can be preserved for a considerable time in the winter, but in the summer, it's apt to decompose very rapidly. We know that. Should be kept in a well closed bottle in a cool place. During that time, some of the glasses required to remain in a silver bath, those which have been drained against the wall, are to have a small quantity of the albumin poured on each and allowed to run over every portion of the moist collodion surface. The glass is then held vertically so as to allow the excess liquid to flow into a separate bottle, which for the sake of distinction will be called B. A fresh quantity of the iodized albumin is now poured on the glass and made to flow over every portion. So what he's talking about, you're going to use a little bit of this albuminized, uh, iodized albumin, cover the plate first, drain it into a separate bottle, then take your iodized albumin again and pour it over and cover it and use that separately. So you're going to do a prep and then a real pour. And he talks about why this is. <clears throat> the glasses thus albuminized are left to dry, the upper part each leaning against the wall and the lower, uh, lower resting on some blotting paper as shown in figure 69. Um, let's go on here. What? Let's go on here. <clears throat> so the albumin uh, surface should be towards the wall to avoid the dust. So Talking about laying, so put your surface inside so you, if you have anything in the air, it doesn't land on it. The reason for getting the plates, uh, two coatings of albumin, is that the first application serves to remove the water which impregnates the collodion surface and allows a second quantity to give a perfectly uniform coating. So it, it's for the coating of the surface. It's to get rid of that water and to get a perfect coating of albumin on that collodion. The albumin contained in the bottle B can be used for a considerable number of times for giving the first coating or until it becomes too diluted with water derived from the plates when a fresh quantity must be used. So you can use that a few times. You're going to do a handful of plates. You can definitely use it for those, you know, five or ten plates. Whereas the employed for the second coating, on the contrary, can be used as often as required, meaning that you won't fill that with water, the, the iodized albumin that you're using for the final coat. The glasses, when removed from the bath of water, should not be allowed to dry before being albuminized. Otherwise, the albumin is spread with difficulty on the surface and stains are subsequently produced. So, meaning you need to take them out of the distilled water, do that first B bottle coating, drain that back into the B bottle, and then do your, your real coating, your final coating. Uh, walking about the room when albuminized glasses are being left to dry should be avoided as much as possible to prevent any particles of dust settling on them. In about 12 hours, they will be sufficiently dry when they can be preserved in definite time if placed in a group box to protect them from damp and direct light of day. So he's saying you prep these, you can keep them forever if they're stored properly. So all foregoing operations are to be done in the dark room and when finished, the water in the large bath may be thrown away, but in the smaller bath, a good approach should be retained for getting the silver out. <clears throat> the following is a resume on the first series of operations in their order. So he's going to go through this. So you clean it, you cut it with a bromoiodized collodion, you sensitize it, you wash it for the uh, first uh, for a few moments in the first bath of water, wash it a second time in the bath where it's left for several minutes. Uh, six, leave to drain. Coat with the iodized albumin, which has been uh, used for removing the excess of water. Then an immediate application of the coating of the fresh iodized albumin, and then leave it to drain. So here we go now. On the evening, or at most the day before requiring uh, to use the plates for taking views, they must be submitted to a second series of operations so as to render the iodized albumin surface sensitive to light. So this is where it's going to get a little bit complicated here. I mean, well, additional steps. A great number of albuminized glasses may be prepared at a time because they can be kept for an indefinite period, whereas no greater number of them should be sensitized and will be used in a very short time as they rapidly deteriorate by keeping. For sensitizing the glasses, a bath of acetonitrate of silver, silver acetate, right, is required, composed of, 473 mils of DH2O, distilled water, 29.6 mils of glacial acidic acid, and 43 grams of silver nitrate. That's what that breaks down to. This bath is required to be filtered before used, and a good aperture dish should be employed for it. After being used for a few weeks, it becomes yellowish tint, can be removed by being shaken up with kaolin, the china clay. 
as a matter, that's how I clean my albumin silver as well, too. That stuff is wonderful. I recommend everybody get some of that. As a matter of precaution, the Cowan may always remain in the bottom of the bottle and the liquid decanted when it's used. <clears throat> At the side of the uh, silver nitrate bath should be placed another, a much larger size filled with filtered rainwater, DH2O. An albuminized glass is immersed with one quick movement in the silver nitrate bath and left there 15 seconds or more. It's then placed in the bath of distilled water, which is shaken a short time to remove the excess silver nitrate. So you're going to wiggle that around again. You're going to sensitize it again, move it around. This being done, taken out of the water, left to dry against the wall in a manner previous described. So you do this right before you're ready to use the plate. It is almost needless to say this operation must be done in the dark with yellow light. The glass is then sensitized when dry or ready to receive the impression in the camera. So immerse the bath in the silver bath for 15 to 30 seconds, place it in the DH2O, and remove the excess silver. Same operation. This is where you're sensitizing the plate. So let's go on. They can be kept a fortnight or two weeks before being developed. Although as a rule, the shorter time that elapses between the sensitizing development will be better, or you'll have better results. To obtain the proofs, not more than three days should, in, uh, be, uh, should intervene between the two operations. In the summer, especially, the time should be as short as possible, obviously, right? In the winter, it may be longer without much risk of injury. The sensitized glasses ought to be preserved in a group boxes, free from chinks or cracks through which the daylight might pass and kept dry as possible. When required for use, they are placed in the ordinary clothing frame for use. They are, however, some frames particularly devised for dry plates, which hold two glasses so you can do, you know, expose on both sides. Most of them use the wet plate and had several holders. Um, the glass is exposed to the light and then the outer simply by turning the frame. The time of exposure for collodial albuminized plates is fully double or triple that required of ordinary collodion. So two to three times of that. So a 10 second exposure would be 20 or 30 seconds, which is great, right? I mean, that really speeds up the, the for a dry plate. That's awesome. Experience alone will guide the operator, obviously. Um, as the pictures are generally developed after returning from an excursion, it's an excellent plan to ensure a good proof any particular view building to take two impressions, but with different times of exposure. The clothing albumin process is particularly well adapted for obtaining transparent positives on glass. You get that? Particularly well adapted uh, for making these positives on glass, which is really cool. I'd love to try this. For this purpose, the sensitized surface of the prepared plate is put in contact with the varnished surface of the negative. So you have a negative. Varnish negative, you put it to the surface of the uh, the, the albuminized Clodio albumin plate to make and sensitize, right? To make this positive, trans glass positive. Um, so uh, negative place close in this uh, close frame, similar to use that for exposing plates in the camera. By opening the sliding shutter, the diffused light of day is allowed to act for two or for three or four seconds, taking care that the arranging the glass in the frame, the light passes through the negative before striking the sensitized plate. Just like you, you, your contact, put it in a contact printer, right? The plate then is taken into the dark room, developed in the ordinary manner. So that's that's really interesting. Well suited for making these glass positives, which sounds really cool. I, I think that's a very interesting. Um, I've never read that for anything else that way. When this process is followed by the is followed, the positive picture obtained has a very good effect if placed before a window. It should be mounted with a plate of ground glass, the albuminized surface of one of, of one in contact with the ground surface of the other, and the two plates united by a border of black paper pasted around the edges. So he's just telling you how to present it. So put a nice. Uh, uh, ground glass behind that positive look really, really nice. So here's a summary. In cool weather, they're good for two weeks. In warm weather, a couple of days after they're sensitized. Um, the uh, the exposure is two to three times that of wet collodion, which is not bad. Making glass positives, which is really cool, right? I mean, that, that's a really cool, that's worth the price of admission here. So let's go to page 80. 
to the right. The following is a method of developing the collodio albumin plates. Place in a porcelain capsule or let's say a Pyrex dish, 15 grains of gallic acid, pour over it three and a quarter ounces of hot distilled water and mix them well with a glass rod. So, uh, and then you, uh, it's dissolved or nearly so. Add 13 ounces of cold water and filter the hole in the bottle for use. We don't need to filter any of this. Our, our stuff is clean today. So 100 mils of hot uh, distilled water, 385 mils of cold DH2 uh, distilled water, 0.56 grams of gallic acid. You dissolve that in the hot water, then add the cold. And then down below, the developer is 1,035 mils of distilled water, 15 grams of silver nitrate, and 0.56 mils of glacial acidic acid. That, for to every 89 mils of developer, you add uh, 0.93 mils of this solution, of that hot gallic acid solution. I know it sounds complicated, but what he's doing there, he's combining everything in, the redeveloper, the developer, everything together. So check this out. This gets real interesting here. And care should be taken that the whole be thoroughly mingled together. Otherwise, stains will form on the surface of the negative. The exposed albumin plate is to be quickly plunged into this liquid. The coated surface upward, raised up and down several times, right? Kind of agitation by means of a uh, hook so that the fluid fl flows over well over its surface. <clears throat> it is necessary that the porcelain dish should be adapted for this purpose. I love glass Pyrex dishes for, for doing this kind of stuff. And with the flat bottom so that the glass may be perfectly immersed in the solution. At the end of the first hour or two, the sky and other parts highly illuminated will have hardly made their appearance. But in the succeeding two hours, the proof usually comes out with extreme vigor. It is always well to watch this operation so as to stop it as soon as the development is complete, which, however, sometimes takes as long as 12 hours. The colder the weather, the longer the time required. In winter, it's preferable and sometimes necessary to develop in a warm department. Uh, very often, in about three or four hours, the development of the image can be accelerated by removing the gallic acid and doubling the dose of silver nitrate. That is to say, to each three ounces of solution of gallic acid, uh, add a half instead of a quarter drachma, add, rather than... 0.93 mils do about a mil and a half um, of silver nitrate. But if this is done, the dish must be kept agitated. Otherwise, particles of reduced silver, <clears throat> uh, which um, are formed, would attach themselves to the pitcher and entirely spoil it. So you've got to be careful about jacking the, the developer too hot on this. To succeed well, two conditions are indispensable. A warm room about 68 Fahrenheit or 20 Celsius, and, a, and slow development. It is very, this is a lot like calotypes, right? This is a lot like calotypes. It is very, also very important that the gallic acid should not be allowed to become colored and muddy. This should happen, the glass must be washed to remove the thick decomposed gallic acid from its surface and place it in another dish with some fresh solution. Basically, you redo that. The last observation is most important, and the operation is one that cannot be too often repeated with, with a proper attention and time exposure and consequent regulation of the dose, doses of gallic acid. The picture should be well and perfectly developed in about four hours. <clears throat> then he goes on to say you just fix, wash it and fix it like a normal negative. Um, and uh, then he talks about overexposure and underexposure. Overexposure is likely indicated by a red tint, which the proof takes after being fixed. When the time of exposure has been correct, the sky begins to show itself in about an hour and very gradually increases in intensity and becomes of an absolute black, even when viewed as a transparency after fixing. The whole of the details are shown with great vigor. This is where you're gonna see that, that incredible detail. You get it with albumin, but now you've added a layer of collodion as well, bromoiodized collodion, while the shadows are perfectly transparent. So you. You, right through the glass, just like a perfect wet collodion negative. If the sky should not be sufficiently dark and it's not possible to take another proof, recourse may be had to stopping out with a little Indian ink mixed with honey and water. So here we're going to do a little Photoshop and a soft camel's hairbrush. 
It is, however, next to impossible to do this operation in such manner that some of the details on the horizon are not injured. Very, very interesting. I love the idea of this. Um, you'll see, I'll try all of these. I'll try all of these. Um, so next week, we'll look at the same operation, but with uh, Sidebotham's original recipe and methodology. I found that and it changes some things up. This is a later, this is a couple of years later. And back then, Monkhoven really loved the process. But Sidebotham is the originator of it, and we'll look at his process. So, so Dale, let's see. Um, let's let's jump in here. Was why cadmium iodide in the collodion? <clears throat> uh, sensitivity and uh, yes, for non-decomposed, uh, 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 for speed, uh, sensitivity, and for the length of the collodion as well too. We want as fast as collodion as we can get. We don't want any. <clears throat> oxidation or decomposition in the iodides. And that's why cadmium iodide. And they they just preferred it overall. They really did. <clears throat> As opposed to another say, yeah, yeah, we're not, there's no, there's no safety here. We got to handle the 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 components we they they suggest if we want to do that. Um, but yes, cadmium iodide was used, you know, we looked at um we've looked at uh, Sutton's, we've looked at Estabrook. That is the iodide they like to use for negatives. That's just, that's what it is. We're really pushing that. Um, they were really pushing that. Hello, uh, Mr. Singh from India. Good to see you. Good to see you. So that is the process. Uh, find it very interesting. Again, I wanted to call this whole series In Search of the Perfect Negative, from Estabrook to Sutton to, uh, to uh, 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 Tower now to side botham and looking at all of these different ways to make negatives and there are reasons i mean some of it's advancement technology but there were reasons a lot of these guys use these very arduous and difficult processes um <laughs> i think they lost almost everyone at the, yeah i know that's what i said that's what i said in the beginning if you haven't done some of these historic processes like calotypy and uh, other things that can take 30, 40 minutes developing an hour or two, I know a gentleman in Paris, uh, he does calotypy, Martin Becca. Uh, he, he has a little automatic system that just agitates his trays like this, two, three, four hours uh, to develop a paper negative. But here's the thing. Um, and I will do this. You will see me do these processes, every single one of them. But this is a great way to introduce them, at least to get you familiar with them. And, you know, I know we're in the 21st century, and God forbid, if we can't have it now, have it fast and have it easy, we're not interested, right? But there's got to be reasons they did these things. And that not saying, you know, side bottom saying, hey, the gold medal in 1862 was won with one of these negatives. What is that? What kind of print was it? You know, maybe, you know, what kind of positives do these things present too? You know, I mean, that could be a whole, that's why I'm really interested in it. Really. I'm going to do some glass oil printing from negatives. Uh, I'll do some of these positives in this process as well. Uh, Craig Dinsdale starting to shoot negatives and want to make sure exposure times are longer than what, by what amount. And do you shoot a tintac? But yes, great question. Those, that's a, those are great. Um, a uh, great segue into that. So if you're just starting out and making wet collodion negatives, the, the bottom line is uh, Archer's uh, manual says one and a half to two times the exposure for a negative versus a positive. If I'm not familiar with the area and I'm using a new optic or I don't know my chemistry that well, I, I, get, I, run, a, I run plates until I get a perfect, perfect positive. So if that perfect positive is five seconds, I'll do seven to 10 seconds for a negative and check it out, right? And then you have a whole nother set of chemistry, right? You have a highly iodized collodion usually, and you have a very acidic or very restrained developer, a lot of acid in your developer. And your development can be 30 seconds to two minutes for a wet collodion negative, you know, depending on, on where you're at with that. So there are some things that radically change 
And there are reasons behind that. There's detail. There's, um, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of reasons for doing that. But those are good questions. And I encourage, uh, you know, a lot of these folks just want to make positives all day, all the time. I get it. Positives are great. You can try to sell me on the one-off factor. and I buy it. I get it. I understand it. But at some point in time, technically uh, or creatively, whatever reason is it is, you're going to move beyond that and want to do, you, you're going to want to push the boundaries. Why do negatives? Well, negatives give you a whole new world to play in. The types of prints, the toning alone, just toning, right? It's a whole new ball game. The types of prints, there are, I could name uh, 10 different types of uh, printing out processes that you could do with wet collodion negatives. And they all come from the wet collodion negative anyway, right? Um, then you get down these rabbit holes on the side that we're, we've been doing for a few weeks with albumin glass negatives and collodion, collodio albuminized plates and now you get off into all kinds of stuff that you can just spend a lifetime. So if you're just interested technically, these are great exercises to participate in. If you're interested creatively, these could give you some new tools or new arrows in your quiver to work with, to get an aesthetic, to get a, a, a look and feel that you're after, right? These, these can be, you can't achieve that with positives. Positives are kind of one trick pony. Yeah, they're one-offs, they're originals. Okay, great. Uh, there's there's a downside to that too as well, right? I mean, um, once they're gone, they're gone. I, but I get it. I understand that that argument. So, real photographers turn negatives into positives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and a variety of positives, right? And uh, my specific interest right now is making glass plate positives from collodion. From, from negatives, sorry, whether they're wet collodion or collodio albuminized or albumin on glass, whatever they are, I am interested in doing that. But I want that negative first. I want that negative. Um, and you're right. They called photographers back in the day, photographers, if you made negatives. Otherwise, they called you a tin typist or an albu uh, ambro typist or, you know, it, 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 it was a different look and feel. And, and I know that's in the commercial realm. They made negatives so you could reproduce the images, which is really important for commerce. Spending a lot of time making one image and producing it, you, you never get the same. You know, you can make it and then copy it and you're making a negative. So there's a lot of commercial reasons to do it. But for me, there are more creative and artistic reasons, aesthetic reasons to do it. <clears throat> Yeah, insert tongue in cheek. There you go. But there's there's a lot of truth to it too. So I encourage everyone to uh, pursue making negatives. I think it's a natural um, evolution um, in these processes. So you can drop technical questions um, anytime you want here. Let let me move on to uh, recommended reading. Uh, cheers. I, I st I'm still drinking coffee. Let me move on. To this book here. This is uh, this is a book I'm going to show you here. Let me see if I can do this. Where am I? Solo layout. This is a wonderful book, um, Mr. D. Augustina, Augustini. Um, this happens to be some of my favorite brands of lenses in here. But let me just give you an example. He does a great intro here. Um, let me get to. I don't know if you, how many of you have seen this, but they're really great um, illustration, photographic illustrations, high def images. But let me get to, uh, I'll show you what, uh, something that might be a little more pro applicable here. Uh, he talks about, you know, pets full lenses, describes those in detail. And, uh, Talks about some of my favorite lenses. So he's got the Deroji in here. He's got the Darlo in here. And each chapter, um, cone lenses describes those. Each chapter has a different heading. So you can look at the dates, the types of lenses, the makers of the lenses. Um, let's see here. Object. Yeah, Hermagie. 
Look at this. I used to use a lot of these lenses. These are great. Gives you the dates and years, everything. Uh, wonderful book. I highly recommend this. It's uh, it's worth getting. I opened it up. And this is. Uh, let me go back to here. I opened it up to to show, and, and you can go to his website there, oldphotographiclenses.com. Uh, Corrado, I think, is his first name, and you can get the book there. I open it up and look what I found inside. I found an albumin print. I found a a test salt print, and then I found another a, a salt print from workshops. They're just stuck in there. I find these things all the time in my books. It's it's crazy. I must think, oh, I'll come back to this. Or I need, oh, I need to flatten them out, right? So I need to flatten them out. I'll stick them back in here. Somebody down the down the down the years will find them in my books and uh, say, "Oh, well, look at this! What is it?" And I I should write on them, I guess. I should uh, I should document them a little bit. Oh, Jeffrey, you just returned that book to the library. Oh, awesome! That's cool. Yeah, awesome. Did you like it? Yeah, yeah. You can learn a lot if you don't know anything about uh, these. You know. De Rogi, Darlot, Hermagi, uh, the Jamin, all that, Petzl lenses. Uh, if you don't know much about those things, these, this is a really good book to help you learn about it. And he's a great guy, too. Uh, your book is a blotter pad. I don't, I don't know. Oh, yeah, right, right. You mean for the prints? Yes. So in the, I think I was using, I, I have like this, uh, I have these great big photo books in my library back here. And I guarantee I open them up and there'll be prints all over in there. I use, I use them to flatten them out. So yes, he has one on German lenses. White lens, exactly. Yep. He does. You can go to his site and check that out. Definitely. Definitely. Wor definitely worth looking at. If you haven't seen that and you're interested in old lenses, I want to show you two different videos here about the calotype. Um, if we don't crash and burn. Um, last last week we crashed and burned for some reason. I don't know. I still haven't figured that out. But Fox Talbot really changed, revolutionized this whole process of photography because he gave us the negative positive process, right? Making the negative, making the print. Um, a huge value in that, like I just got finished ranting about. Um, Daguerre gave us the direct positive, uh, and then Archer came along and gave us the uh, the negative positive process again. But what's the difference between Fox Talbot and Archer? The difference is Fox Talbot's was going through paper, Daguerre or uh, Archer's were going through glass. So there was a quote quality difference there, right? Um, so I want to show you two different uh, videos. This is the first one about Fox Talbot, and then we'll look at actually making a calotype. I, I got really into calotypes 10 years ago in Europe. I started making calotypes and really loved them. They were, uh, and again, again, quite intensive, uh, a, you know, a high failure rate, a lot more involved than wet collodion or any of these other processes. But let's take a look at this. I'm going to play this. So I'm going to mute myself so I don't get, give you guys feedback. William Henry Fox Talbot revolutionized photography in Britain. He invented the first photographic negative process, which became the basis of virtually all photography that followed. Talbot was an expert in many fields, including chemistry and optics, the study of light and lenses. But Talbot could not master drawing. Instead, he looked to science for an alternative way to capture what he could see. In 1834, he began to experiment with ways to make and fix images using light and chemistry. Scientists already knew that silver, when combined with salts, was sensitive to light. With this in mind, Talbot coated paper in a solution of table salt, then a solution of silver nitrate, to make it light sensitive. This combination of chemicals caused the paper to darken in sunlight. To make an image, Talbot placed an object, like a leaf, 
on top of the sensitized paper and left it in the sun. The object blocked out the light, stopping the area underneath from darkening. This left a reverse impression of the object on the paper. The resulting images were known as photogenic drawings and became the first photographic negatives ever produced. Tolbert went on to experiment with the process using homemade cameras. When he placed sensitized paper inside one of these, light reflecting off a subject traveled into the camera, making an image on the paper inside. Like photogenic drawings, the paper registered areas of light and dark in reverse, creating a negative. When Tolbert placed one of these negatives onto another sheet of sensitized paper and exposed them to the sun together, the dark areas of the negative blocked out the sunlight, while the white areas allowed the light to pass through. This created a positive print. With this, Tolbert had invented the groundbreaking negative to positive process. For the first time, multiple prints could be made from a single negative, which could be used again and again. Tolbert patented his process in 1841 with the name calotype, which means beautiful impression in Greek. Tolbert's invention of the negative to positive process led the way for photographers until digital technology arrived. So there's an overview of what Talbot did. Now let's look uh, from VNA again. Let's look at this. I, I don't know the gentleman's name. <clears throat> They'll say it here. Um, but this guy. Rob Douglas is a specialist in making calotypes. The first stage involves preparing the negative under red light. A light sensitive solution is mixed. Its active ingredient is silver nitrate, which darkens when exposed to light. Drops of a weak acid solution are added to balance out the effects of the silver nitrate and keep light areas light. The sensitizer is applied to paper, which is placed inside a wooden holder for a camera. The camera is loaded and the lens cap is removed to let light in and expose the paper negative inside. Because of the way light travels, the image appears upside down on the camera's viewing screen. In bright sunshine, it takes around three minutes to capture the image. But at this stage, it is not visible. In the darkroom, developer is prepared to bring out this latent image. The timer is set, the developer is applied, and the negative begins to appear. The key developing ingredient is gallic acid, which speeds up the reaction of light with the silver solution on the paper to reveal the image. Once the negative is dark enough, the paper is submerged in a solution to wash away any remaining silver and fix it. To make a positive print, another piece of sensitized paper is placed onto the negative in a printing frame. The frame is flipped over, taken outside and exposed to light. Sunlight passes through the light areas of the negative, turning those areas of the paper underneath dark. It can take anything between five minutes and a few hours to create the positive image, depending on the strength of the sunlight. So, yeah, if you guys ever want to look at calotypes, I mean, we I got a whole list of stuff I'm going to do before that. But if you ever want to look at calotypes and do a, a, a segment on that, I'm happy to do that. I made many calotypes. Again, they're very interesting. Um, not a whole lot of demand uh, for public demonstrations or people working in 
Um, you know, here's the thing. Let, let's just say this outright. Let's just talk about the elephant in the room. Positives are sexy. They're great. Positive tin types, uh, luma types, uh, glass plates in, in public. You can do them, demonstrate them. Oh, wow, you see them coming up in the fix. You see this about every other month. Some newspaper, some I get these emails all the time. Some newspaper does or TV station does a, a piece on someone and they're bringing back the wet clothing process and look at this come up in the fix and oh, ooh, and it is, it's cool. I get it, I get it. But there are a whole bunch of other very fascinating and interesting historic processes that you can try and you can work in. Calotypes are something that are just very poetic. They're very, they're soft. They're, uh, they, they can be, basically they can be anything you want, really. I mean, you're one step away from wax paper negatives, which would compete definitely with a glass, wet clothing glass negative. You know, Legray's wax paper negatives are incredibly sharp and, and have a lot of diversity. Um, I would like to show you, if, if people are interested in this, I would like to show you um, a video about Martin Becca, a friend of mine in Paris. We used to go over uh, for the show in Biev, the uh, photo, big photo exhibition that's been going on and, uh, and sale that's been going on there since 1964. Uh, this Saturday, they have what's called the hardware and Sunday, the software. Saturday is the the lenses and the cameras. And when I first went there in 2009, I am not kidding you. They had tables. I bought a Hermagi. Um, I don't, it was huge. I can't even remember how big it was for 600 euros there. Um, it'd go for thousands and thousands of euros now. But when I first went there, they were just tables of brass lenses and cameras. And it was way before the whole rage happened, right? And then Sunday, you can go there and buy books and prints. And, and it's, it was just wonderful. I got to do a whole Collodian thing there one year and got to meet the, the governor or mayor of the town. And they presented me all this. It was great. It was, it was fun. But um, we used to meet Martin every year at his house on Friday night and have dinner and show work and go into his dark room. And he's done a whole series. He did a whole book on uh cityscapes of dubai with these calotypes wax paper negatives um and um and this special albumin print printing he does i'll show it to you sometime on the show here um i i just saw it the other day looking through my stuff so if you're interested in that let me know um <clears throat> what paper did you use for making calotypes great question um there are a couple of different papers, but you need to get uh, the just like kind of like crowbar in albumin. You know, you need you need a certain paper. Um, there's a couple of them. I, I just saw them in my boxes down there. The name escapes my mind right now because I've had, you know, it's been years since I've made any. But um, there are certain papers. Uh, I've got the whole I've got the whole notes on making calotypes. I got the whole thing on. I will share that if. If you guys are interested in doing looking at calotypes, um, I definitely can can turn you on to that. Yes, uh, Annabelle, good to see you. Yes, Martin Becker. Um, he he's uh, Martin Becker. Martin Becker, not Becker. Becker, wonderful gentleman. Um, lives in Paris. Uh, he's probably I would say he's the world's best calotypist in my mind. I, I don't think I'd get any argument from that. That's what he does. That's how he makes his living. That's 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 who he is and what he does. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll arrange something. Um, maybe I'll do that in the next couple of weeks. Next week, we'll look at uh, Side Botham's version of Collodio Albumin Negatives. And you may be more encouraged by Side Botham's uh, process than mock Tobin's process it it may go a little quicker for you so we'll look at that next week if you have anything you want to share during the week i appreciate that again jeffrey sending me that um uv that was a great kind of lead into all of this um then have, have come on in to uh, send it to me let let me let me know about it and we'll 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 do it uh we'll get it on the show here Yes, I, I would do that, Annabelle, but he doesn't speak English. He doesn't speak much English, and I and he's very uh, 
he he's very um, uh, introverted. A wonderful gentleman, the nicest nicest person you'll ever meet. Kind, gracious, giving, just amazing. Um, he has got, by the way, he has got a sheet of paper uh, from Legray that was waxed uh, and and made prepared by Legray, and and he did wet collodion too. He showed me his couple of positives he tried, and he's the guy that turned me on to the writings and documents that Legray probably invented the wet collodion process, but and because Archer took all the notes from Legray, but 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 forfeited that wet collodion process for the wax paper negatives and a lot of history there. It's interesting. I don't know if there was any real uh, competition, but well, I appreciate, I appreciate that. And maybe I will, maybe I'll write him and ask him if he'd come on. Um, I can show you his video though. Um, yes, I will. I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, Martin Becca. Great, great guy. Um, let's see what, Anything you can offer will be appreciated. I'm sure everything's been. And, oh, good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I try. You know, these shows are di uh, difficult sometimes to not uh, regurgitate stuff over and over and over and over again. Some of this is good. Some of the technical stuff is great for repetition. Uh, some of it just gets boring. I don't know that I could offer anything more on positives. There's 200 and some shows up here now on the Studio Q stuff. Um, been going on for years. I don't know. You know, and I know people like fresh and updated stuff, and but I don't know that I could offer so much on positives anymore. Negatives, I can still offer some things, uh, and especially when when we get experimenting with some of these. So, um, but I will put together a show on callow types. I'll do. I'll probably do a couple of pieces. I'll introduce you to Martin uh, via video. I'll write him too and see, but. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show you his video anyway. He does this wonderful image. He reproduces this image of this castle in, in France and in, in the in the country. Um, really, really good stuff. So if you're interested in that, stick around. I'll put that together. But next week, we'll continue on to this uh, with this Collodio Albumin process. We'll find something interested, interesting to share with you with uh, for reading and i've got a whole library here i could spend a year just recommending books behind me there that i think you would enjoy or get something out of um annabelle says i'm digging into cali type and albumin prints from digital Land. get okay yes yes you know we can do that i would love to start doing a pop printing series and go through all the pop processes again because there's so many good ones uh uh, aristotypes, gelatin and collodion binders, albumin, salt. Um, you know, I, like I said, digging through this book and finding the, the albumin and the salt and these different uh, prints from workshops is really fun. Um, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Annabelle was, uh, was in the, in a workshop. I think you came to, uh, was that in Spain or France, Annabelle? I can't remember. It's been a few years now, but Annabelle is, is doing some good work, too. Last time I talked to her, she's still doing landscapes. And if you want to come on the show, come on and share some work with people. I haven't had a guest for a while. I'm in, I'm in conversation with a, a woman in Berlin that um, Fareed turned me on to. Um, and I hope, uh, I hope she can come on. Yes, I am. I am in. I know that you're flexible with people doing that from digital prints. So that good. Yes, absolutely. I don't, guys. I don't have any, any hangups technically about if people want to work and take scan stuff and bring it in. I don't. I don't go for it, man. Whatever works for you. That's great. Positive in Paris, negative in oh both. Okay, there you go. She did both courses. I I did a lot of them in Paris and I did a lot of it in Barcelona both. Oh, Pablo says, Annabelle is one of the most moving landscape photography ever. Well, that's very nice. Did you see that, uh, Annabelle? Pablo uh, Pablo really likes your landscape. So very nice. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's good. I love to encourage people. I love to, to try to help people and encourage people, especially photographers, artists that want to do, uh, expand their horizon, look for new aesthetics, look for new stuff to work in, get inspired by make work about, you know, um, whether that's technical, whether that's post-production, whatever it is, um, 
it, it's I love to do that. So come on and share with people. People want to know what, what everybody's doing in the process. Um, and, and, and come on and share your work. I'd love to have you on. So thanks for joining me this week. Be safe, be healthy, be happy. And I will see you next Saturday with some more hopefully good stuff. And uh, I love I love your participation. I love your feedback. Don't be don't hesitate to write me if you've got something um, that you want to share, or something you might think works for watching or reading or whatever. I appreciate it. So we will see you next week. Thank you, gentlemen, in the live show. I appreciate it. Pablo, Jeffrey, Bogusla. I hope you come back next week. We'll see everybody next Saturday. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye.